Sunday, July 27, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is the founder and publisher of Courier, a pro-democracy digital news network with newsrooms in 11 states. Tara McGowan, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thanks, Anthony. Now, you, you um, aside from your excellent work with Courier Newsroom, you are also uh, quite prolific with your own memes, which I follow and I love to see. And I messaged you after you posted this video, the moment you got the news that, that Joe Biden was stepping down and Kamala Harris, or he was endorsing Kamala Harris. We're back in the car with the breaking news. Um, President Biden the most effective, truly the most effective president in my entire 38 years on this planet, just announced that he's not running any longer for re-election and moments later announced that he is endorsing Kamala Harris to take his spot at the top of the ticket. I am so unbelievably relieved, excited, fired up and ready to keep doing the work because we're going to win this thing. We are going to win this thing. The prosecutor versus the felon. The woman of color versus the man who wants to be Hitler. This is our fight. We are going to win. Let's go. Uh, It's hard for me to describe. So maybe you could describe that moment and how that felt for you. Ooh, um, yeah, I, I mean, I have been, I have been talking with so many of my friends and colleagues in this space who do this work. And, um, it really feels as though that moment is one of those moments where everybody will remember where they were. Um, oftentimes those are tragic moments or very bad news story moments. And, um, and yet it was just really poignant. And, uh, I, I was actually home. I recorded that video in the car cause I, I was late because I heard that it was happening and ran to turn on the television. I rarely turn on, um, uh, to see what was going on live. But, um, I, I mean, I had a strong suspicion that there was going to be an announcement that day. I had heard, um, some things before that, but, I. Uh, I think we were all collectively holding our breath. Um, That was not an easy decision for President Biden to make by any means. Um, He's one of the most effective presidents we've ever had in this country. Um, And yet I think it was ultimately the right decision. And I I think um, while there was a sense of relief immediately, there was also deep sadness, Um, sadness for him and sadness for this moment. And you know, I don't think anybody wants to be told over and over again incessantly by, you know, the world um, that you're too old after having been such um, an amazing person and still an incredible president to this day. So there was sadness. But then I really appreciated and just loved that the endorsement of Vice President Harris came immediately afterwards because it was able to give us this moment of a little bit of grief and sadness and relief and then really, really exuberant joy. It's very hard to describe um, how immediately the energy and enthusiasm shifted both in my body and my soul and my mind, as well as I think collectively um, across the country and maybe ripples around the world um, for this really incredible and extraordinary woman to potentially be at the top of the ticket. And, you know, since that period of time, she's secured enough delegates and she is our, she's going to be our nominee. Um, And it has changed this entire election. Um, The stakes of the election have not changed, but the opportunity and the enthusiasm and the energy and certainly the vibes, as we know, elections are really determined by vibes, um, have shifted really profoundly. We should probably just address initially the the issue of him being old and aging and I, I was thinking about the fact that you know years ago people used to live with their elderly relatives and look after them in old age these days they either just stick them in a retirement home or move states so they don't have to de- deal with them and I, do you think as i do that people have actually forgotten what the aging process is like which is why there were so many conspiracy theories that he had this or he had that illness or you know so so much was said about him and all I could really see was a man who was just 
aging and aging quite a lot in the last three or four years to the point that whilst his brain was still working, his body was struggling to catch up. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's um, if it's detachment or disassociation or lack of exposure to aging or actually universally everybody knowing people who they who as they age and and being concerned because even where they still maintain maybe their mental acuity or their other things, they just don't have the energy to do the things that they used to do. And if you think about it, the president of the United States is the hardest job in the world. Um, it is more responsibility and pressure um, and it, than any other position I can imagine. And the impact of that position and the influence of that position is just so immeasurable that, you know, if you worry about your aging parent or grandparent being able to kind of keep up with babysitting your young kids or being able to, you know, have multiple activities in a day and you think about that same age person or somebody who, you know, still has a lot of um, health and well-being and fitness and great care around them, having to deal with the pressure and the decisions on not just a daily, but a minute by minute basis and to be ready in a crisis especially in a moment where everything is so disruptive and um, the information cycles are saturated. The world is moving quickly. Technology is moving quickly. Um, industries are being really disruptive and undergoing enormous, really rapid transition. You know, I think a lot of people, even boomers are like, I don't know that I could keep up, right? Like yeah. things are changing so quickly. So I do, I do think that there was a deep personal connection that people felt to their concerns and their worries that that got louder and louder over time. And then, of course, there was certainly a faction of people that that felt that they had been deceived or lied to. And that's the worst thing that you can feel in our politics, especially if you are a strong, strong supporter and values aligned and a longtime Democrat or longtime supporter of Joe Biden to feel that that you weren't being given access or exposure to how quickly his aging process had had been accelerating and that feeling breeds mistrust. And that is, again, the worst and most dangerous thing that can happen in politics. So regardless of the facts, right, that is where conspiracy theories are bred and, and took traction even amongst Democratic elite circles, to be very clear, that needed to be shut down. I really think ultimately when that started to happen after the debate, that was where this is, there's no return from this. He's certainly never going to get younger. And so when a lot of, you know, elected officials were calling for him the days after the debate to kind of prove that he could keep doing the job and have the energy, I kept asking myself, what could he possibly do? He can't get younger. He can't drink some miracle serum. He can't do a backflip. He probably never could. So what is it exactly that we're asking for? And that's where it really kind of became clear to me that this was going, this was going to reach the point of no return and a very, very tough decision was going to have to be made. And, and he did it with such unbelievable grace and leadership and selflessness for this country and our democracy. We saw that in his um, Oval Office speech this week that I thought was just so beautiful and poignant and, and also sad. But this is a man who has committed his entire life to public service for this country. He has been through enormous personal uh, trauma and, and traumatic experiences in losing so many members of his family. And, and, and yet what he has done and given and sacrificed for this country, including in this moment and in this decision is just, it, it really kind of shakes me to my core in, in terms of just immense, immense gratitude and admiration. The, the, the address to the nation, he, he had COVID this week, of course, so that didn't help and probably maybe contributed to his decision to step down. It's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm done. But the address to the nation was very powerful, aside from the fact that he was clearly still unwell and, and didn't have much voice. And so it, it, it kind of required the viewer to really kind of listen and to get close. And he said, it's time for younger voices. And he urged Americans to unite to, to save U.S. democracy. Do, do you think he made the case clearly enough of how high the stakes are in November? I think absolutely. And I think by his decision alone, that everyone in this country knows who was paying attention, that that was not an easy or obvious choice for him or for any person at that level of power and with that many, 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 many years of sacrifice and experience. So just by the decision alone, but also, of course, in those remarks, I mean, I just got goosebumps again when you were, you know, just paraphrasing them because 
I feel energetically, and I know millions and millions of people do in this country and around the world, that it is time for a generational change in leadership. Um, not, not, not to be ageist at all, but just to be able to actually confront the challenges that we face today and that our youngest generations are going to have to um, live within the bounds of and be able to handle and confront from, from the increasing um, horrific effects of climate change that we're going to continue to see absolutely ravage communities um, across the country, in the world. Um, we still have a massive gun violence epidemic in this country. Um, we know that there are threats seen and unseen um, globally and domestically uh, in terms of violence, political violence, cyber warfare. There, It's just, it's a very, 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 very different world today. And I do believe that it's a different country. And there are more people under the age of 40 eligible to vote in this country um, than ever, ever, ever before. And having representative leadership matters. Um, it very much does. And I think that we all can actually sense how that's been proven out and how quickly um, a movement for progress and for democracy here and abroad have embraced Kamala Harris and her campaign, how the Democratic Party unified within hours of her after many, many, many conversations driven by the media and a lot of folks who didn't know what they were talking about, about an open or a brokered convention. To me, it was always obvious she was on the ticket no matter what, and she is the best, 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 best candidate to have at the top of the ticket to take us into this new chapter um, and to really prosecute the case against a convicted felon, um, uh, among many, many, many other things uh, and descriptors that I could provide of Donald Trump. So I just I think that um, it felt as though all of the chaos and the frenetic energy and the anxiety that was just sort of encapsulating this election for a very long time, it it dissipated. And I don't want to overdo it because we still have a very, very hard fight ahead of us. This is still going to be an incredibly close election because of the electoral college in this country, because of the division in the electorate. And yet you can feel physically um, the shift in the energy and the enthusiasm. And enthusiasm leads to votes if it is translated, because it translates into dollars, it translates into memes, it translates into engagement online, into volunteer calls and door knocks and ultimately votes. And so this was the deficit Democrats had before President Biden's decision. And this is now the opportunity and the surplus we have to work with and channel. Let's talk about the media, because you, you have a lot of experience, as I do. In fact, we have this in common. We, we both set up our respective news agencies because we were so dissatisfied with the, the corporate media and the way it, it either had a bias or it failed to ask the right questions or hold people to account. And so and I'm thrilled at the success that you've had with, with Courier and, and some of the, especially on social media, the memes and the explainer videos and all of that stuff. It is so useful to useful to me, but useful to everybody to kind of really explain the importance of a, of a modern democracy and, and, and how high the stakes are. But the but I've said in previous videos that Joe Biden's tenure was kind of trial by media. And whereas Donald Trump is a made for television president, he's not a real president, like he can't actually do the job in the Oval Office, but he's very good on camera, very good in the TV studio. And that's basically the polar opposite to, to Joe Biden, who's very good at presidenting, but not very good at, at presenting. And so <laughs> these, these are very impressive, aren't they? One is a delegator, one is a dictator. So with that, the media, I feel, were so at the throat of Joe Biden over the last few months that really he didn't stand a chance. Even if he could take a magic elixir drink and rise to the occasion, it was the media that were wanting to take him down by nature of their allegiances and their desire to reinstall their box office success, Donald Trump. That's exactly right. Um, it is confounding and depressing to be in those moments uh, as we were to be reminded of the power legacy media brands still have. Um, they don't reach uh, even a, a tenth of the population anymore with their business models and their old media uh, distribution channels, but they certainly have the ability 
still today, I don't think for too much longer, but at influencing the the conversation among elites and uh, and that, as we know well now, makes a world of difference. Um, you know, the, the polls did need to change, I think, for President Biden to ultimately make the decision, because when he was standing his ground very firmly uh, at, before he had made that decision, it was because he was rightfully incredibly angry and upset and offended by the media's campaign to take him down because it was not representative or reflective of um, of where the American people were ultimately at that period of time. And so um, I have an enormous amount of empathy uh, for him and that frustration, because as you mentioned, we both share that frustration with how the media operates and they often operate out of really misguided um, incentives. Um, I, I, I also, I would add to not only the, the desire for them to have a more interesting, compelling candidate and race to cover and to drive views and engagement, I also find an enormous amount of hypocrisy because I think a lot of them were also operating out of fear that was shared amongst everyone who wants to stay in a democracy in this country that Biden might not have been up to the job. And so for brands like New York Times that are enormously defensive about any claims that they put their thumb on the scale and that they are not objective or non-biased, I actually think secretly they were terrified about the prospects of a Trump administration and decided that they were going to claim objectivity and then absolutely use their power and influence to affect the outcome um, and the ultimate decision by the president to have a better shot of a race that could also be Trump. I've never heard anyone say that out loud, of course, but I don't think it was actually just about ratings or I, I think that it also uh, was them operating out of some fear and anxiety, which I think a lot of us can also relate to, but you can't have it both ways and they try to and, and that also breeds a lot of mistrust um, in the media that I think is rightfully deserved. And media ownership has changed over the last few years as well. CNN is a perfect example of this. And, you know, I, I don't know if you were as frustrated as I was with the moderators during that debate, their failure to push back against Donald Trump's lies, the fact that they just sat there during, you know, pushing loaded questions to Joe Biden and, and giving Donald Trump a much easier ride. It, it was so frustrating and so obvious that they'd been put up to this. But, you know, whatever their personal views, they'd sold their souls to the devil. Yeah, look, this is the this is one of the many, many, many problems in uh, mainstream, and, mainstream and corporate media today is that they are optimizing for their ratings and their engagement more than they are optimizing for informing their audiences or engaging them in 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 civic participation um, in a genuine way. I don't believe that we got um, a fair debate out of that debate. That is not defending Joe Biden's terrible performance by any means, but Donald Trump was standing there gaslighting and lying the entire time without any accountability or correction. And they made that decision because they, they wanted to have a, a clean and clear debate. And then that's, but that's not how journalism works. Journalism is about holding great powers accountable, and there was zero accountability um, in that debate forum. And I, I have respect for for Jake and Dana as uh, as reporters and individuals, and and yet I think that was probably a decision made by you know the the corporate structure uh, to be able to appease both candidates' interests and desires, and you know put on a program that wouldn't have them fighting directly with the candidates. Do you think Kamala Harris should agree to more debates with Donald Trump? Or are you in the same camp as me where you don't think any of these debates should be happening because it just legitimizes this insurrectionist and convicted felon? So I, I actually am in favor of debates and more debates. I think they are a really important forum in our democracy. Um, I was pretty outspoken when candidates on both sides in 2022 were, were playing their own cards to get out of debating. Um, you know, again, I stand by everything I just said about what I didn't think went well or was produced 
well or fairly by CNN in this last debate. But I do think having the candidates that are running against each other to represent the American people or to represent constituents in a district or a state or a local constituency is really important. Um, I think that they should face each other and really debate their positions and their ideas. Of course, we know that it's theater. Theater has always come into it. And so, yes, it becomes who can perform the best under that pressure and under that spotlight, which isn't always fair, but I don't think we're going to change that ever. I do think that you have to be able to perform um, to, to get the masses that you can't meet individually face to face to know you and trust you and support you. Um, so, and I also just would love to watch Kamala Harris. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say that. the yeah. floor with Donald <laughs> Trump. I was excited to see her wipe the floor with J.D. Vance. Yeah. Um, I will be excited to see whatever vice presidential candidate she chooses to run alongside her to wipe the floor with J.D. Vance, as I like to call him. Um, but uh, I do think it's an important informant forum, and I know that it doesn't actually reach or engage a lot of especially younger folks, unless there are viral clips, which tend to not be the most substantive parts of those conversations. But I think that it would be uh, it would be a tragedy to lose uh, a debate forum entirely. Trump uh, was caught in a in a rally saying that he hates being laughed at, and and we kind of identified that as his Achilles heel. And so I thought it would be rather marvellous if Kamala Harris employed her rather excellent laugh to embarrass him for everything that he says during those debates. That, that's the only bit that I was kind of looking forward to seeing. But I just believe that the moment you invite a, effectively a domestic terrorist into a television studio, you're putting them on a pedestal. And, and I just wish that Donald Trump would be delegitimized and deplatformed because this is not a normal election. It's not a it's not a two horse race. It's not equal. You know, one one is is a fascist. And I think I often say to people, like, if you could go back to 1933 and 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 be tipped off as to what Hitler had planned for seven or eight years later, do you think you would give him a debate stage? People would be like, of course not. I mean, that's what we're dealing with here, Tara. Well, you're also touching on the other really, really egregious double standard imposed by the media outlets that made a huge case through their editorial board um, opinions and other things that Joe Biden should step down. There is nothing in the Constitution that, that suggests someone of any age in their 80s or older cannot run for president the same way. Unfortunately, there is nothing in the Constitution that says a, a convicted felon can't run for president of this country. So why? Why would folks go out of their way to suggest that it was malpractice by the Democrats to have a candidate who is the current a president and a very effective one step down because of his aging and not demand the very same from a convicted felon? You think about that long enough and you're really befuddled by it, right? And that's because they are getting something from Trump running that they weren't from Biden. Um, and and so I I mean, I just I think that the contrast could not be stronger from a convict between a convicted felon and a former prosecutor um, in Vice President Harris. She shines in so many ways. But when she shines the most, it is when she was on the hearing stand grilling people um, about various issues and Bill Barr, concerns. for example, absolutely. About, yeah. And Kavanaugh, the Kavanaugh yeah. hearings, um, yeah. you know, the, the, she is, you want her, she is the fighter in chief that we want and we need. And she is, she has a, an incredible background, but then she also has this joy and softness about her and this beautiful marriage and love story with Doug, who I cannot wait to see as the first gentleman of this country. And um, I just think that that contrast is going to be really profound. And I also think that it appeases the media in terms of a narrative and a story um, that's engaging. But I, to your point, the fact that there was no accountability or scrutiny or demands or pressure placed on the Republican Party related to the candidate they put up who was a convicted felon and rapist and et cetera, et cetera, potential traitor, given his deep, deep relationships and collusion with Russia and Putin. Um, it's just, uh, you know, it, it really makes you wonder about their incentives. Just going back to the debate for a second, it's almost as if America was more happy to take somebody lying but doing it coherently 
than someone telling the truth incoherently. Let's just talk about that for a moment, because, and I'm not saying that Donald Trump is coherent. In the, in the main, he isn't. But on that particular day, it was clear that he was more agile. And, and so it's almost as if the message is less important than the delivery. Do you, do you think that we need, as a country, we need to take the, the, the messaging more seriously and worry less about the delivery? I do. I don't think that um, where our communications and media infrastructure and where and how we all consume information and where that is going um, I, in terms of technological innovation, it, it's it's moving at such a rapid rate that unfortunately, I don't know that we're going to get closer to substantive dialogue and debate on messaging. I fear that it will continue to get um, shorter and more skippable and more performative in many ways. Um, I don't think that is entirely a bad thing. I think a lot of things are lost. Um, as we were just saying, you have to be camera ready. You have to be a performer to some degree. And to pair that with substance is, is the real, you know, that's, that's what makes for a really strong candidate. But to your point, you don't actually need the substance anymore if you can handle the performance and, and the engagement with your supporters, right? It isn't just that Trump is a skilled performer, understands the attention economy and how to get attention. It's also that he really understands uh, his base, that he has really manipulated and deceived and evangelized around him. Um, I, to, to be his fierce protectors and, and to be loud, a very loud, um, non my majority of this country that is really rabid about their support for him. And so, you know, we've had this throughout history with these demagogues and what they're able to do and their cult like effect on communities who are susceptible to their manipulation, to their manufacturing of consent. And so I, I, I do, I, I think one of the saving graces of where technology is and information and sort of how and where and why people spend their time and get their information, a silver lining there is that authenticity really does matter. Um, that isn't the same thing as honesty. Um, I, you can be your authentic self, which I think Donald Trump really is, and spew entire bullshit out of your mouth. But people are actually going to trust you and listen to you because of how you make them feel. And if you, if you are espousing your authentic self, regardless of the words that are coming out of your mouth. And I think that that's where, um, you know, a lot of old establishment candidates, and that's not Joe Biden. I don't think, I think Joe Biden has always been his authentic self. I think that's been one of his strengths, his whole political career. But, you know, people who are not comfortable um, being their authentic selves really, really, really struggle in this day and age. And we're not seeing that um, with Kamala Harris right now. I feel like she rose to this occasion and we're seeing her at her best these past few weeks. I don't think that's an accident. I think some people really do rise to occasions. And, and when they're, you know, when they are being good partners or second, um, you know, string team members, they're they're. They are not sort of showing all of that for good reason. It's not their job. But um, I, I think that that's, that's actually what people respond to and always will. And the way that that is conveyed through the camera, through debates, all of those things is really important. It's interesting that you mentioned Doug because that, that paid for kiss on the cheek that Trump got from Melania at the end of the RNC was very telling, wasn't it? That, you know, he, he, she's obviously like a wife for hire now, you know, I, she doesn't want to show up to anything unless you know there's a some kind of transaction i presume but to show up and then to kind of not give him the lips and go for the cheek was very awkward and it did not show any kind of sense of of, of romance or unity in that department and it just to me just doubled down on how everything he says and everything he does is faked it's it's a it's a production whether he's going into chick-fil-a and randomly bumping into some black supporters who happen to be working for him you know it, it's it, i think i'm hoping that people will realize as kamala harris exposes him as for his in, inauthenticity that that she is the real deal and and he is just a a, a production 
Yeah, there was also a clip that went fairly viral from the RNC of when uh, his youngest daughter went to hug him and say hi to him as she was crossing him to get to her seat. And he literally turned away from her. Like, you can see how his relationships with his family members and his wife are very reflective on the surface of who he is as a person and a husband and a father. Um, and, you know, there is a there is an audience that um, uh, admires and probably wants to emulate the ability to just have a really beautiful wife who shows up uh, and makes you look better by just standing beside you, but you don't actually have a substantive relationship or any respect for her. Um, those are not the folks I care very much about, but there's a community of them in this country for sure. They're called misogynists. And, uh, and I do think that, you know, Americans also love a good story and they love a love story. Um, and we had that with uh, Barack and Michelle. You, you know, yes. you can't you can't put a exact value on it for a candidacy or or an election prospect. But it does matter because it makes you feel good to see people have loving, mutually respectful relationships. And it also has an immense um, effect on on people. It models, right? Like you are also a moral compass when you are the president of the United States or you're an elected official. Um, you're modeling um, the behaviors and the representation um, that makes for a strong, strong country. And we haven't had a lot of representation um, uh, at, the, at the top levels. And I think that that really matters. They are not only a couple that is in love, they are also a biracial couple. They are also from different uh, religious upbringings. Um, they, he has children from a former marriage that she is the stepmother to. Like that is a that is an American family. <laughs> um, it's, well, it's not. It's normal, isn't it? And, yes. and I think it, it, it doubles down on the authenticity and it reflects American households. Whereas the Republicans would have you think that everything is compartmentalized and that if you are a family, then you're just white Christian and Trump supporting and, and you know, there'll be no person will be, oh, hang on, I might be trans or hang on, I'm, I might be gay. None of that is none of that is, is an option. Um, I want to talk more about this. I also want to talk about the attempted assassination on Donald Trump and whether it changed his currency in, in any way. We'll do that next here on The Weekend Show. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention. And Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. Now, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. 10 seconds on the clock. How many things can you name that are always growing? Your relationships, your skills, your customer base. How about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling t-shirts and Midas Touch merch, and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. <laughs> 
Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back on The Weekend Show with Tara McGowan. I'm Anthony Davis. Um, there was an attempted at assassination of Donald Trump, not from a Democrat, but from a Republican, a, a young white male, which did not really suit the narrative from MAGA Republicans. And obviously the investigation is, is still underway. Uh, he lost his life in that, as did somebody else in the crowd. Two were seriously injured. Donald Trump was not, though. And, and this is really the most interesting part of this story is that what initially people thought was a, a, a bullet taking off the top of his ear, because of course ears bleed a lot, it turned out that it possibly wasn't a bullet at all. It may have been shrapnel. We've heard Christopher Wray, the FBI director, refusing to be drawn on this in a, in a hearing on, on Wednesday. But either way, Trump is back out with no bandage now and apparently no wound either. He clearly has milked this, as, as indeed he did in the moment where he put his FBI he, uh, Secret Service people at, at, at risk by making them stay on stage longer than was necessary so he could get a photo opportunity shouting fight into the air with blood on his face. That was his kind of Che Guevara moment. Do you think that that has, has caused his star to rise any higher? Will, will more people vote for him because they feel for him because his life was, you know, someone tried to take his life in that moment? Look, I think any episode of gun violence in this country or political violence is a tragedy. And um, I don't love the line that comes out of a lot of politicians in those moments where there's no place for it. I agree there shouldn't be, but we absolutely have political violence in this country and more so than we've had in my lifetime, certainly, um, specifically because of Donald Trump um, and his inciting of it and his uh, encouraging of it and his uh, organizing of it, frankly, in the violent siege on the Capitol January 6th. So um, it's it's not that I have no sympathy because I think an event like that is horrific and I'm sure incredibly traumatizing to everyone who was there, um, incredibly traumatizing and heartbreaking for the families of the two individuals that lost their lives. Um, and, and yes, I think he did use the moment and I think in the 24 hours afterwards, it did feel like this groundswell that could be um, that could have a real impact on this election. And then, you know, we all know how the news cycle was the past few weeks. It was chaotic. There was history being made every day. Um, it, it, it didn't have staying power because of everything else that was going on. Um, and that was that was uh, organic. None of that was Land And so maybe it could have had more of an effect. But look, I, I saw the tweet that night from a Newsmax reporter. This is a reporter for a conservative news organization who was on the ground at the rally in Pennsylvania, who went to a briefing by the Bethlehem police in Pennsylvania afterwards, who tweeted that they suspected it was actually glass shrapnel that was hit by the bullet that hit his ear and not a bullet. And she got trolled and screamed out on on 
X and was saying, this is not my opinion. This is literally what the police said. And then you never saw it or heard it again until the report that came out this past week. And, you know, I, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but I do I do have strong instincts as a former political strategist for a long time. And my instinct was that they wanted to bury that medical report and that information until they got through the RNC because his bandage played a big role. You saw some of his supporters rocking a bandage in solidarity, which I thought was super bizarre. Um, but so, you know, I think that... Um, I don't think that story is done. There has been less information about the shooter than we've had from any uh, uh, mass shooting um, uh, in the past many years. And that's peculiar to me. And, um, you know, I think that it's going to be interesting and the story is certainly not going to go away. And it was a tragic event. But I, I don't personally believe that it um, that there was any positive outcome for his candidacy or campaign out of that event, outside of um, what will be forever a very historic photo opportunity. You know, in the, in the same way that people blame Merrick Garland for the delay in holding Trump to account for January 6th, I also lay a lot of the blame at the foot of Christopher Wray, that the FBI director, he has his own political allegiances, I believe. And I really felt that when he was talking about this incident, claiming to not know and not have the information. And I was like, this seems not quite right. Like, I'm not hearing the full story here. And, you know, is there a chance that this issue we have of, of having Trump loyalists installed in our institutions, obviously we've seen it in Florida with Judge Eileen Cannon, we've seen it on the Supreme Court, but, but even someone like Christopher Wray just kicking things into the long grass, get behind that election. Look, I in the in the year twenty twenty four, I think anything is possible, Anthony. Um, I I also you know I don't like to dabble in what could be seen as conspiracies or anything like that. I like to work with the facts. I think it is strange there haven't been more data pieces or facts that have come out about it yet. Um, I look forward to seeing them and hearing them when we see them. I mean, I think it was just today or maybe last night that Trump came out and and made a claim that Kamala Harris uh, was behind the assassination attempt. So we know that there is only one party and one candidate who does um, very much, uh, I, you know, um, work in the business of driving conspiracy theories and disinformation to try to build an advantage. And I think that that is reckless and ruthless. And uh, it's um, it's very, very, very unsettling that he is using um, a tragic event and a potential assassination attempt on his own life to try to create a political advantage. Um, that just shows you exactly who he is um, and certainly um, will play to an audience who are susceptible and attracted to conspiracy theories and theories about a deep state. And, and they won't be the ones who put two and two together with the documented plan in Project 2025 that on day one, he would replace tens of thousands of civic Service, civil servants across our government agencies and the federal government with Trump loyalists. So what you're commenting on that could very well be true with the FBI director, he intends very explicitly to only have loyalists to him work in our federal government in the agencies that he would not dismantle and disband immediately. And that is not a democratic government. That is an authoritarian regime of which the people have no say, power, or control. Let's talk about Donald Trump's reaction to Kamala Harris being handed the torch, because he was not happy about it. Uh, you know, initially, there was complaints from the MAGA Republicans that the, it wasn't fair that, that the Biden-Harris funds were now going to the Harris campaign, which is completely legal and normal. So they made a complaint about that. Donald Trump saying, you know, we've been focusing our whole campaign on taking down Biden and, and now it's Harris. It, it's, it's a bit of a curveball for them to deal with. And, and I heard them say that they're now going to have to pivot their hatred 
and their anger towards her instead of him, which is such an awful way to play politics. Instead of just talking about your own policies and, and, and laying out your stall, you have to fire these kind of this this hatred at the other side. So talk to me about how you think Trump is going to handle Kamala Harris going forward, because there's only 100 days left until the election. Look, Trump Trump is smart enough to know that uh, he shouldn't be talking about his policies because they're incredibly unpopular among the American people. So he would like to talk about anything but his positions and policies, frankly. Um, and yeah, I think... Look, we went from a period of a few weeks following the debate until last Sunday where Democrats truly were in disarray. It was incredibly uncomfortable and anxiety ridden and frustrating to watch and experience both as somewhat of an insider and just an American citizen who wants to keep a democracy in this country when all the dirty laundry and division and debate and arguing and name calling was was happening out loud in the media for some unknown reason, uh, with a lot of self-important people getting involved. And then suddenly that Sunday decision by the president and endorsement by Kamala entirely flipped this entire election on its head. And the disarray every day since Sunday has been in the Republican Party. Um, they are losing their shit. Excuse my language. You can see it. They are freaking out. They are not organized when they were the party of quote unquote unity, whatever that means, the party of division that is unified for division in this country um, beforehand. And, and, and now you can tell they have not narrowed in, including Trump, on what a clear focus of attack will be on Harris. So they're throwing the kitchen sink at her. We are going to see more racism and sexism again. And I think, I think that they are going to rely a little bit on what Trump might believe worked with um, when he was running against Hillary Clinton in 2016. But I want to remind everybody how different the world we live in today is. Um, you know, that was before the Me Too movement. That yes. was before the George Floyd Black Lives Matter movement in this country. It was before the pandemic and the trauma that people went through. And, and it was and, before Trump's presidency as well. So, yes. you know, we have we have that record to deal we with. We have those receipts and understanding of it. Absolutely. But my my point is, and the electorate is different, is is younger and more diverse than it has ever been. And I will tell you. People under the age of 30 have no tolerance for sexism or racism. Truly, it crosses partisan lines. It crosses gender lines. It crosses conventional wisdom and, and historical trends. And I really believe that they are being caught incredibly flat-footed be, because the attacks that rile up their base are only going to be used against them. The backlash of those attacks on Vice President Harris, I think really, really, really is our strength and opportunity and also incredibly aligned with our value system as Democrats and as people who want to maintain a, a diverse and representative democracy in this country. It's very interesting. I think what you said about the fact that the world has changed, and America has changed, in, in, certainly in the last eight years, is really important. Donald Trump won't know that, though. He's going to play this as if it's 2016, 2017, because that was his moment of greatest success. And, and I suppose that that will be a, a short-sighted move on his behalf. Let, let's talk to this racism and misogyny issue, not just from the Trump camp, but from the country as a whole. We often hear this question posed, is America ready for a female president? and as well as a, a person of color. Well, Barack Obama dealt with that one back in 2008. But this is, this is the dynamic duo, isn't it? This is being black and being female. Talk to me about, about the US and, and how it might have changed to be open to somebody who is, is not an old white man running for president. Oh, it has changed and it has changed in a way that makes this not even possible, but probable that Kamala Harris will be our next president and the first woman president of this country who will be a woman of color. Um, it is it just it sends shivers throughout my body um, because it, it 
I don't believe that we weren't ready to elect a woman president with Hillary Clinton. Um, I think that she really struggled with a lot of baggage of being seen as an establishment Democrat because of having to carry so much of the baggage of her husband and his personal, you know, activities and how those became very public um, and very. And relevant. James Comey, of course. American story. And James Comey and the fact that she had been villainized for decades before she ran. So while she also had a base of incredible, enthusiastic, passionate supporters and support, that expanded from her first run in 08 to her second one after serving as Secretary of State um, in 2016. Uh, it, I think that we were ready then, but there were other forces at play. There was also Russian intervention. There was also third party votes that were the margin of error in this country. So, you know, it was death by a thousand cuts, but it was not because she was a woman. I don't believe it. I think this country has been ready for a woman to be president and is ready. And certainly, um, I don't think it matters uh, what race she is. I think that, that that was transformative with Barack Obama winning um, in 2008 and then winning again, strong re-election in 2012. And so I, I, I don't even think it's going to be a huge part of the conversation this time around. And I think that's to the benefit of the American people and this, the stakes of this election is that this is not about whether or not we're ready or willing to elect a woman. This is about who is the best person for the job on the ticket, who is representative, who stands on the right side of the issues, and who can really legitimately and effectively prosecute the case against Trump and MAGA. Um, because we know that even, even when we win against Trump, Trump won't be able to run again, but he certainly has a base of of supporters and and followers, um, including shady vans, who will follow in his footsteps. So MAGA won't die in this election cycle, um, certainly. And and so I think this new turn, this new corner that we are turning with new representative leadership that is strong um, and and capable and also incredibly inspiring um, is. Is, is the emotional contrast that we were lacking before that now we have. And I think it's going to energize so many more people who are going to stay at home in this election because of apathy or, or just frankly, uh, you know, feeling as though neither party or candidate represented them because there was nothing exciting or interesting or new about it. And all of that has shifted. And I really believe that we, we could see a far less close election. I'm not going to count on that, but I actually think it's really possible because you cannot underestimate what enthusiasm can do. We have a very limited amount of time, as you mentioned, but we have a lot to work with and channel. And I think, again, that Vice President Harris has it. She's just got it. And I think a lot of people are learning that for the very first time, and it's really exciting. What's also different between now and, say, 2016 is that Abortion has been banned. Roe has been overturned. How important is it, do you think, that the messaging for this election is being done by a female, considering that abortion is probably the most important issue for people going, going into this election? Of course it's important. Of course it's important. It's representative. I will say it's, it's very important to have men who, who are on the right side of this issue and who stand by women and advocate for them to create a permission structure for more men. We've talked about this when you've had me on before that I really think it is still a huge problem that uh, for, for every abortion that occurs in this country for any reason, there is a man that was involved in that who is not speaking out um, about how it benefited their ability to live their lives, make decisions that were right for them to family plan at a time and a, that was right for them. And so I, I, I do, I don't want to discount, I think, the importance of men being representative on this issue as well. But of course, it's important. I was saying tirelessly, tirelessly um, before the debate that we needed to recenter the conversation in this country and in this election on abortion, because that has been the issue that has animated, enthused and mobilized millions of people who do not re vote regularly or at all 
or have only ever voted Republican in states like Kansas and Indiana and Ohio to vote in down ballot and midterm elections since 2016. Um, it is the 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 increase in support for abortion in all instances after the Dobbs ruling is incredible. It is uh, it is no longer a controversial issue. In fact, it is a liability if you do not stand on the side of reproductive freedom and choice politically in this country, which is why Republicans and Trump don't want to talk about abortion and they've been trying to distance themselves, but they can't. Because that Supreme Court that made that decision and will make future egregious decisions about a woman's right to choose, make choices about her own body, that court was built by Donald Trump. The majority ruling on that court comes from three justices that he installed on that court. And so, and I do think that we are going to get some exciting announcements about court reform out of the Biden administration over the coming days, which are long overdue, but really important because of the corruption of that court under Donald Trump. But but this is the issue that will be, I think, the most important and critical issue. And Kamala Harris has been the fiercest advocate, protector and fighter and defender of abortion rights and access in this country. And so that contrast, especially with J.D. Vance on the ticket, who has called rape, quote unquote, inconvenient, who supports I mean, who opposes abortion in all instances, instances, including rape or incest, who has been on the record saying that women should be at home, who has come out against no fault divorce. I mean, this is a true misogynist. Well, he, he called Kamala Harris a childless cat lady. Th- that's he where his his mind is at over this. Of course. And he, he, he even said the other day, we covered it in a few of our newsrooms at Courier, um, he made a comment that people who didn't have children shouldn't vote in this country. I am a 38-year-old woman without children or without plans to have children. That's deeply offensive. It's deeply offensive to all the women who can't have children, um, who have tried and been unable to for various reasons in this country. It's also just bullshit. It's just really, really, really misogynist, sexist bullshit. So I don't think that there are enough people in this country that support that view that can give them a upside on this, an advantage. And I really do believe that it is going to be the most mobilizing issue beyond just who these candidates are and who they represent. I like to point out that the 46 previous presidents didn't give birth either. And uh, I think that's (laughs) <laughs> worth noting for, for, for J.D. Sure no president of the United States in our history has ever given birth to a child. Yeah. So going forward, the, the momentum is obviously significant and it feels good at the moment. But are you and I living in a bit of a progressive bubble? What about middle America? How, how do they feel about Kamala Harris? Because Unfortunately, you, you alluded to the ele- Electoral College being rigged in favor of Republicans earlier, which is absolutely true. And so it's often with the, with the U.S. general election, a, a strategic game of winning certain states in a, in a certain order, visiting those states as a candidate, and, and really trying to kind of play the system to get a win. So, so outside of the coasts, what do you think the feeling is uh, among Americans who maybe traditionally wouldn't consider someone like Kamala Harris as as their type of candidate. Yeah, there's, I, I mean, so it, it's absolutely true. We are in a uh, infatuation phase, if you will. I, I don't think that's a bad thing because again, it creates a lot of enthusiasm that can turn into donations and volunteers that can get the word out and have the conversations with the folks that you're talking to who maybe don't know anything about Vice President Harris, maybe have their own issues, were strongly in the corner of Joe Biden for various reasons, but might not be now. Um, You know, all the pollsters and data analysts are freaking out because suddenly the race is entirely different. And is the map the same? Will it change? You know, where are her vulnerabilities? Um, These are the questions that are being asked and trying to be answered amongst all of the people trying to do the work to to win this election on both sides, frankly. Um, We have, I am not a polling person. (laughs) I am an instinct person. I am a vibes person. But um, polling can be useful in just getting, uh, you know, signaling of sorts. And, you know, 
all of the polls that I've seen lately, two more came out today, have Kamala up over Trump, of course, within the margin of error. But Joe Biden and Trump were always within the margin of error between each other, um, just a few points between each other, whether one was up or down. There was never a big delta between the two. And we are seeing her not lose any gain from Biden, but in fact, to be ahead a few points than Biden was in most of the average polling. So that's really, really confidence building and exciting. Um, I do think that change in and 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 energy is something that is very contagious as long as it is channeled appropriately. So while we don't necessarily know where her soft or weak spots are among the electorate, especially in some of the Rust Belt communities and states that Democrats will need to win this election, I, I do believe that the enthusiasm gap being really closed in a big way among voters under 40 who are going to be the biggest challenge for Democrats could make up for some of those losses or even put us in a better position and advantage than we certainly were in. I am still concerned about a third party threat. Um, I am slightly less concerned because it really was um, concerning for me, people who were not just always alternative or independent third party voters, but folks who really didn't like either candidate being an old white man and were looking for something new and different. They now have that in Vice President Harris, hopefully. But it's still it's still it still worries me because um, because of how close these elections can be. So everyone needs to do everything. Right. We also yes. <laughs> can't be blinded by this optimism and this hope and this feeling of, of real joy and and promise of, of this election being different and potentially more advantageous for us. That has to translate. Everybody has to do the work. We have 100 days. That is not very much time at all. And everybody has to talk to everybody and share all of the things on their social media channels um, to be able to really, really, really keep this momentum going and turn it into votes. And and thankfully, honestly, the short timing gives me a little bit of hope too, because people are actually going to start casting early ballots in September. Um, this is a matter of weeks away. So I think that we can work really quickly and diligently. And Vice President Harris raised over $100 million in 24 hours of, of the announcement. That is incredible. And so keeping that momentum going um, is just so, so, so important. Well, let's talk about her, her campaign in, in just a moment. We have to take an, another quick break. But um, th you're right, the, the fundraising has been incredible. And often, you know, I agree with you, the polling is often way off the mark. But the funding isn't. It's actually quite a, a powerful barometer. And a lot of the funding, a lot of the support has come from individuals who have never donated before. And that in itself is, is very interesting, isn't it? All right, well, we'll do that and more with Tara McGowan next. Most Americans think they spend around $62 a month on subscriptions, but the real number is closer to $300. That is literally thousands of dollars every year, half of which we've probably even forgotten about. Thankfully, I started using Rocket Money. They found a bunch of subscriptions that I'd forgotten about, and they helped me cancel the ones that I didn't want anymore. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has saved a total of $500 million in cancelled subscriptions, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash weekend. That's rocketmoney.com slash weekend. Rocketmoney.com slash weekend. Lumen is the world's first handheld metabolic coach. It's a device that measures your metabolism through your breath. And on the app, it lets you know if you're burning fat or carbs and gives you a tailored guidance to improve your nutrition, workout, sleep, and even stress management. All you have to do is breathe into your Lumen first thing in the morning and you'll know what's going on with your metabolism. Then Lumen gives you a personalized nutrition plan for that day based on your measurements. You can also breathe into it before and after workouts and meals so you know exactly what's going on in your body in real time. And Lumen will give you tips to keep you on top of your health game. Because your metabolism is at the center of everything your body does, optimal metabolic health translates to a bunch of benefits, including easier weight management, improved energy levels, better fitness results, and better sleep. 
So, if you want to take the next step in improving your health, go to lumen.me slash weekend to get 15% off your Lumen. That's L-U-M-E-N dot me slash weekend for 15% off your purchase. Thank you, Lumen, for sponsoring this episode. Welcome back to The Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. The Harris for President campaign has launched its first official video less than a week after President Joe Biden announced he was dropping out of the race and that Kamala Harris said she was running for the nomination. The, the ad caps a week during which Harris also broke fundraising records and quickly clinched enough delegate support to become the presumptive nominee in an election that is now just over 100 days away. The ad that was released on, on Friday morning opens up with shots of Harris's smiling face behind the podium and the word Kamala, the word Harris and the American flag. And the soundtrack is the start of Beyonce's song Freedom, to which Harris entered and exited her first speech to campaign staffers after gaining lightning speed momentum on the road to becoming the presumptive nominee. Beyonce is a perfect person for this moment. If we if we had to kind of say just sum up this how the how the nation feels right now and what Kamala Harris has to offer, my answer is Beyonce. Would you agree? I mean, you can't argue with Beyonce. <laughs> it's it's like getting and being anointed by the king. Get it? Get it? Getting being it's supported better, by Beyonce's. I think, I think it's better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would. You would. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, no, it's, I, uh, what a way to come out the gate with a surprise campaign. You didn't know you were going to be running, right. yeah. um, which I did do a little video about yesterday just because I did, I woke up just in awe of putting myself, trying to put myself in the vice president's shoes and having had to suddenly become the, the democratic candidate for president and, 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 and put a whole campaign together. Luckily, obviously they've created so much continuity, which is so important because yeah. you can't lose that time. Um, but that's just a very, very, very intensely overwhelming and extraordinary experience that she must be having right now. And I thought that that first ad and really, really captured the energy shift that we feel and the enthusiasm and the and and the message, the substance of it. It was the message we were all missing. Well, well she yeah. said, she says, in this election, we each face a question: What kind of country do we want to live in? and talks of some people who think we should be a country of chaos, of fear, of hate. And then she says that as we see images of Trump and, and Vance. But she says, but us, we choose something different. Th that really, that, that message is, is so powerful. And no matter who you are, you cannot deny that America is desperate for a shift, for a societal shift, for a cultural shift, and for somebody to bring about change. And the direction that we choose that she says in the ad and goes on to explain is freedom. Yes. Freedom has been something that Democratic operatives have been wringing their hands over how the Republican Party co-opted freedom and the flag and patriotism for so long. But this really is the contrast in this election is fear yes. and chaos and lies and convictions and corruption opposed to what we are all fighting for, which is the freedom to make decisions about our own body, the freedom to live in a country without fear of being shot down in our schools or in our movie theaters, the freedom to be able to afford health care, to take care of ourselves and our family, the freedom to be able to afford education and equal opportunity. And it's just that framing nails it. That's actually what we all want and are fighting for, the freedom to be who we are, to love who we love, to live the lives um, that we've imagined for ourselves and our families. And and no one had really crystallized that contrast better, I think, than she did in her, the message that they are, they are running with with this campaign. So there, it's just honestly, it's been so inspiring to watch. And I just, for people who've never worked in campaigns or politics to know that this stuff is not easy and people litmus test and test a million things and they over test and they over sample and, oh God, it's like messages can be created and candidates in a lab. She had a week. She had yeah. a week and maybe that is a lesson folks can take because I, I haven't I haven't seen anything better that has really captured the way people feel about this contrast and the stakes of this election and the need, frankly, that we all have to have something to look towards, not just to fight against. But it's another point that I've been making lately is that 
yes, you need the fear and urgency that has catapulted Democratic Democrats victories up and down the ballot since the 2016 election. But what we also know to be true is that Barack Obama and the hope and promise he brought to a change election in 2008 was so critical. And now we suddenly find ourselves with both. We have the fear and the urgency and the stakes, but we also have real promise and vision for a country that we all want to live in. And I think that's just going to be a very difficult argument for for Trump to win. Well, his argument is that we are a nation in decline. That is completely the reverse of, of what Kamala Harris is offering. And so in a way, he's he is doing himself a disservice by going down that road of talking about a nation in decline when she is offering like a phoenix rising. She is offering sunshine and she's offering the type of freedom that, that they don't stand for. I mean, their version of freedom is the freedom to shoot somebody on your property and, and own a whole militia. And the, and the freedom to be racist and the freedom to be misogynistic. That's their version of freedom. Hers is quite different. That's exactly right. And another strength that she has is she has the freedom to both take great credit for so many of the amazing accomplishments of this administration that she has been running hand in hand with President Biden, while also having the freedom to distance herself from some of the decisions that he made and some of the things that were not resonating with the American people and to provide this new and, and frankly, improved vision of where we're going and to be the representative, inspiring messenger and leader of that vision. Um, I just, it, this couldn't have been designed. It had to happen organically. I believe it. it. Obviously, it was a lot of really difficult circumstances that got us to this point. But I just, I really am grateful that this is where we have ended up and feel just more hopeful and more energized than I personally have in a very long time doing this work. I, I don't want to um, dampen your fire but I want to suggest something. And that is that the insurrection is still going on, many people say, and that there is a very good chance that if Donald Trump loses, that he will contest the election and he will then go to the Supreme Court. And that now that the court is so clearly stacked in his favor, not just with his three appointees, but with Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas, people who have very much laid their cards on the table. And we've seen that recently with the Chevron decision, aside from the immunity decision, we should not forget, of course, which is completely insane. I mean, only a, a, a country like Russia would you have a Supreme Court going, yeah, yeah, the president can have total immunity. And yet he made that happen here. That is, that is the legacy of Trumpism. So, so what are the chances of us seeing this whole, not necessarily a fake electors scheme and a riot, but something else that is probably more judicial, that is going to frustrate the hell out of everybody off the back of the November election? Look, I know that I am um, effusive with my joy and optimism right now because I am letting myself feel those feelings because we are in a really extraordinary pivot moment, but I am also a very clear-eyed pragmatist and someone who has worked in politics for a long time and also a student of Trump who I have been working against since 2015, um, every day since, unfortunately. And um, I have my own sort of whiplash with my own joy and optimism where the thought crosses my mind many times a day, which is what is Putin planning now? And, um, and how we should never underestimate a desperate man who frankly is running for no reason other than at this point to keep himself out of jail. And so we know that he has no floor in terms of what he is capable of. We know that he has the courts, he has the Supreme Court um, that are explicitly um, going to support him given that immunity decision. We know that that is a risk that we have in front of us. It is why, and I, I really hesitate to say this because I know it sounds um, a little mystical, but like, we need a landslide <laughs> to prevent that. We need um, a very comfortable win margin, because if any of the, the battleground states are too close to call or contested, they will ultimately get to the Supreme Court. And we have lived through this before as a country in 2000. 
Um, well, some of us have. <laughs> Gen Z was not around, but they should be educated on it, that this is what happened. The Supreme Court ultimately decided that George W. Bush um, would win that election. And so we know that it is possible there is a precedent for it. We, we know where this court stands and what they will decide in a situation like that. And so it's it's more important than ever that people do understand that mistakes. And they 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 aggressively, persistently pester their friends who are on the fence or don't think their vote matters when they live in states like Arizona and Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin um, and North Carolina and Nevada and you name it. And so, I, I, you know, I don't want to downplay how how close this election could be. And if it is that close, how it won't be decided um, by the electorate because we don't have um, a popular vote election in this country. Um, and so I, I do worry. And I do think that, you know, the the energy is going to settle down from this this infatuation and honeymoon phase that Democrats are in at the moment. Um, and we should all brace ourselves for whatever high jinx um, I, they might have coming. We also know Russia was involved, intervened, in the 2016 election, they are already active again. Um, Putin has a lot to lose. He's got a lot to gain with Trump, who is very much a puppet of his for reasons we still don't fully understand or know um, what deals have been struck between them. But we know also with J.D. Vance on the ticket, um, who has relations and connections with Russia and has been very explicitly opposed to funding and supporting Ukraine in the war against Russia, we know where they stand. It's not going to be the top issue for most Americans that are lower information or less, uh, you know, less politically engaged who we need to turn out. But it's really, really important that folks are clear eyed about this because um, this, this there will be more events that occur between now and the election that we can't necessarily predict, but we have to be prepared for. In his address to the nation, President Joe Biden alluded to the idea of Supreme Court reform. Something maybe that he could pull out just before the election, hopefully sooner. He said he was going to call for, for reform of the Supreme Court. Is he going to call for it or is he going to do it? Because, you know, there's a couple of things I'd really, or maybe three things I'd like to see Biden deal with before he leaves office. One is to abolish the filibuster, if that's even possible. Number two is to pack the court. And number three is to pardon his son, Hunter. I would very much like to see that done in the, in the final days, probably just before the inauguration in January, because, of course, Hunter Biden has been criminalized for something that nobody else would have been criminalized for, simply for being the, the son of, of, of President Biden. So let's deal with the Supreme Court reform. Do you think that there's a chance of that happening? Uh, I very much do. I, I mean, I mean, President Biden has said as much, right? He has he has um, he has laid out the cookie crumbs for us. I think it's coming very soon. I am not an expert on this. I don't know how much he actually can do in his own authority through executive action or decision. Um, you know, the language that you mentioned call for means that he would be calling on Congress. I expect well, he that has immunity now, of course, so he could do whatever he, he likes. I mean, have I would love him to take advantage of that. That is very true. Um, he, I, I believe that what he will be calling for um, will be a step in the right direction, but not the full slate of things you mentioned that I would also very much like to see most specifically uh, expanding the courts, um, which there is precedent for. I think instead he will call for ethics reform, which is long overdue um, and hopefully would come with more enforcement and accountability towards the ethics codes of the Supreme Court. And in addition to that term limits, which I think is, you know, also something that will be quite popular um, since the Supreme Court is at its lowest level of supporter popularity um, in the country that it is seen. Uh, and that is a step in the right direction. And we know that that's how progress works. You don't get everything that you want at once, but you move in that direction. And that opens the door to be able to push for more um, extreme reform uh, that would actually bring us back to a place of, of, of integrity with our court system that we have lost. Kamala Harris made a, a speech on Thursday. Um, she paid homage to Joe Biden, of course, but she talked about Republicans pursuing extremist policies that will take the country backwards. I just want to kind of finish with this. The, the, 
the clarity that is required to explain the difference between what Democrats have to offer, true freedom and, and unity, as we as we discussed, but also how high the stakes are regarding Project 2025 or Agenda 47 or whatever you choose to call it. Either way, Donald Trump hasn't read it, but that's still what his administration will, will offer. Because, you know, it, it's very difficult to explain to people who are not that engaged in politics quite how significant this juncture is in American political history. Choosing, choosing freedom versus fascism, choosing dictatorship versus democracy. How would you sum that up in this moment? And, and, and how is Kamala Harris best placed to really make this message crystal clear? I mean, I was I was outspoken um, before the shift in the Democratic ticket that I, I truly and I still believe this, that Democrats could have anyone at the top of the ticket and win this election if we organized folks. Of course, some would drive more enthusiasm than others. And I think we got the one that arguably drives the most enthusiasm, especially among younger and um, and voters of color that that Biden was not doing as well with as he or other Democrats had in past elections. So I think that she is the best person for the job, but despite who the candidate is, I think the contrast, that storyline does really write itself. It does really get to the core of what country we wanna live in, um, what country we wanna raise our families in, um, what country we want to be and the ideals and values um, and, and example and influence we wanna project around the world with the great power and responsibility um, the president of the United States still has. And, 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 and also what role um, we want to play in protecting and strengthening democracy abor abroad, where it is truly um, at risk, not just here, but there. And so I do think it has been, um, uh, it has been difficult to make that um, case as clear as it is now um, with him as a convicted felon. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of the images of January 6th again, because I think that is really important because yeah. guess what? Most Americans, regardless of their party persuasion or their ideologies, they don't support violence and they don't want it and they don't want their kids to see it and they don't want to. They don't want to grow up in fear or live in fear. And so I, I think that that's also a part of it, because we've talked a lot in this conversation, Anthony, about the the extraordinary power of imagery and of of um, energy and enthusiasm and 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 authenticity and things of that nature. And so just the visual contrast of the diverse crowds cheering on Kamala Harris at a rally and the images of the siege on the Capitol that that Trump really um, incited and and protected, and you know he wants to pardon all of those insurrectionists if he's elected, and it's just it, I think that I think that is going to be really really powerful for people um, of all ages and backgrounds. That this is really about protecting our rights and protecting our ability to actually have a say. Um, and when you operate from fear and scarcity, it is easy to get people on board with the strong man ideal. But when you operate from a place of strength and abundance and joy, like we are currently seeing with Kamala Harris's really nascent but powerful campaign, um, that is something more people want to become a part of. That is the making of a movement. And that is what truly, again, I didn't feel like people really were connecting with, even though um, they weren't on the side of, of, of Trump or authoritarianism or what have you, but they, they weren't as, um, they weren't as believing necessarily that an alternative could actually come into play that could change things for the better. And I think that that's the opportunity and that's the story we have to tell the American people now. It's so interesting, isn't it? That, that, the emotions that you describe, that sense of unity, togetherness, the joy of having a leader who, or a future leader who is eloquent, articulate, intelligent, and, and you know, ticks all the boxes. It, there's a great sense of, of feeling looked after. And I think that that's what society and communities are always looking to, the idea that it's okay you know, they've got my back. And I think people obviously felt that enormously in 2008 with the election of Barack Obama. Yes, we can. And that notion of hope as opposed to fight, two fists, different words. <laughs> but with Kamala Harris, there is a sense that her experience as vice president, her passion 
for women's health care, women's rights, equal rights, human rights, and civil rights is, is absolutely crystal clear, and that she is going to be the person to, to meet the moment. I very much believe that she is, and it's all of our job to to get her over the finish line um, and and have her lead us into this next chapter that could be so much brighter than we were imagining it. So it is uh, it is a good moment, and for also just to stay clear eyed that the fight is is far from over, but a hundred days, um, I believe I believe that we can pull it off. Okay, Tara McGowan, thank you for joining the weekend show. Thank you, Anthony. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. See more of me on the five minute news channel. And I'll be back next Sunday with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch.